It is Friday, May 11th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was a very, it's a very, very intimate get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Friday. Uh, there was only me and one other student for the uh, for the class and so you know we uh it was very intense i mean you know everything we did was concentrated on me or the other guy so you know <laughs> so we were, we were pretty busy the whole time you know I, and uh i yeah it was very very intense i i certainly enjoyed the uh the additional pace you know a little little bump up in pace um, but I I decided not to go for for any sparring today, only because my my arm has been kind of bugging me. So it's it's one of those things where it's I, I push it until it just is, it starts to bug me at all, and I'm like, okay, I'm probably putting a little too much strain on it for right now. I'm gonna go ahead and let up and let it heal, you know, because. <sighs> It's a persistent thing, you know. I gotta been, I gotta start stretching out a little bit more, and uh, I have been icing, and certainly going to be doing that here today. Um, but yeah, on the crypto front, um, it, it, things were were terribly exciting this morning, and uh, and a little bit of last night, and with some declines, there has been some a little bit of pullback. Now, how how long in duration that's going to be, and to what effect it will carry us, I don't know. But it does look like we're you know might be might be in for a a temporary slump. But apparently there was some actual causes for it supposedly, and we are going to be talking about that today. Um, but uh, I didn't mean to cut jujitsu off so short on that, but. Um, you know, we we did some standing drills today, and um, we really need. I, I need to do more standing drills, honestly, because jujitsu doesn't really start on the ground. You know, it's it's like that. That's where it ends up. But there's still there's there's quite a bit of game that's that's done standing, and it's uh it's an aspect of of my jujitsu that has been quite underplayed. I just I haven't been. Uh, getting enough training on, on that from my classes, and I haven't been doing enough open mat, of course. Um, but you know, honestly, half the time I feel I'm I'm just recovering from injuries, <laughs> you know. But I guess that's the curse of being as old as I am with regard to this, and the fact that I do tend to push a little bit faster pace um, than probably a lot of guys my age. Um, I did roll yesterday, you know, because I, as you all know, I missed out on Wednesday, and so uh, I did manage to uh, to get in and, and at least get a fundamentals class in. And honestly, I felt like it was it was important because today when I went in, I was focusing a lot more on my butterfly guard um, than I had been normally, and it that's like one of those things where if I get two days off. I just I forget that I have it. It's like, oh wait a minute, there's this thing. It's called Butterfly Garden. You can do that, you know. <laughs> it's like I I don't know why it's it's one that I I tend to you know neglect a little bit, but you know it's it's something that it, for whatever reason I don't pick it up until like the the second or third straight day of jujitsu it'll be oh yeah there's this thing it's a butterfly guard put the hooks in and <laughs> get a little bit of control here I, I can do that you know i can put my foot on the guy's knee and push it out from under him get a little sweep going on you know it's it's funny because it, it definitely tell it definitely takes me a solid you know two two back-to-back consecutive days to to really get that back into my repertoire, and I, I don't understand why it's not a more natural thing for me that, you know, I'm not like immediately going, oh, hey, yeah, butterfly card. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it was a, um, it was an interesting class today, although I felt, I felt like, um, it would have been a little bit better if I had a little more diversity of partners, um, but Jake is very, very skilled. So, I mean, it wasn't a skilled issue that I was having, you know, it's like, He's a very very skilled guy, but the uh, 
the thing I was having trouble with is, of course, the guy's very tall. He's very slender, very tall, very slender, uh, by comparison to me, anyway. I'm short and stocky. And so, like I said, uh, yesterday I had some guys that I was rolling with that were about my size and, and more my body size, or my body type, rather. And um, I, I felt like I got some good rolls in. Um, we were playing touch the calamari or touch the touch the octopus. It's you got this plastic octopus, and you set it in between you and your opponent. And the objective is to get your opponent to touch it. <laughs> and uh, um, I did not touch the calamari, although my my opponents my opponents certainly did. And then of course the uh, the objective, of course, is avoid doing push-ups at the end, which. If your opponent touches the calamari, they do the push-ups. If the score is if the score is even, you both do the push-ups. And of course, if your opponent wins, you do the push-ups. So it's it's kind of a win-win. You know, it's like if you if you lose, you get more exercise. If your opponent loses, you get to laugh at them. If you tie, then you both get to exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a win-win all the way around, right? Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. And uh, I wanted to start off something w- with something new, but you know, I've got such a such a very very thick repertoire to choose from these days that uh, you know I, I'm not entirely certain where to start off at. So let's go, Cavalier Conspiracy Inflicted here on Coin Metal. First dance. And that was Nevermore with a future uncertain. <clears throat> yeah, uh, our future in crypto is, uh, I think it's pretty certain that cryptocurrencies are going to be a fixture in the future, not a, uh, not something that's going to go away anytime soon. And um, I saw this interesting thing, if I could find it. And it was suggesting that the um, unconfirmed transaction number on Bitcoin is going back up. And that's... Uh, I think, if anything, that's that would cause the, the price of Bitcoin to decline. Um, you know, I, I've been... Looking at some people's analysis of why Bitcoin shaved about 15% um, over the last couple days, or the last day or so, and uh, I, I would think if the mempool were backing up again and the uh, and the fees were getting more expensive, that people would be wanting to shift over to other coins in order to transact. And I saw something else on here on my Twitter feed uh, that seemed to indicate that uh, Bitcoin Cash is getting more profitable to mine. And I, I think that uh, that's something we, we got to watch out for, okay? Because the fact of the matter is, is that Bitcoin Cash, they are going to have this fork. I guess it's on the 15th, so four days from now. And, um, and that one is supposed to... <clears throat> bump them up from eight megabyte, um, an eight megabyte block size limit up to a thirty-two megabyte block size limit. I mean, could you imagine that? That's sixty-four thousand transactions per block. I a, ma- a maximum of, okay. But when you look at what that would do to the cost for block space, oh Jesus Christ! You could stuff everything in those blocks and still not make it too expensive to use and i think this is where bitcoin is going to start seeing some start having that you know long dark tea time of the soul where they're they're looking at all of the liabilities that going off chain can bring to bitcoin and all of the questions that it would bring that, you know, all, all that uncertainty, it's just too much, I think, anyway, to be tolerating. 
You know, you want to run it on a on a separate project. Fine, run Segwit Coin on your own fucking miners, and let us get back to Bitcoin as we've always done it, and scale the fucking thing up. I mean, we don't have to go to 32 megabytes, but you know, I mean, if if Bitcoin Cash shows us that that's not only feasible, <clears throat> but that it's also it's also affordable and it also does exactly what we need it to do, such as drop the goddamn transaction fee and make it so we can fit more transactions in per block, you know, increase the block size along with adoption, which is how we've done it this entire fucking time. You know, but no, we got to go off-roading. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've got the road well established. We know we know how to get from point A to point B if we want to relieve the fucking congestion on the on the network. We need to afford more fucking block space. Is that that's just that's how we've done it before. It worked before. It'll work tomorrow. Bitcoin Cash has already proven that eight megabytes is not something that is not doable. You know, and as far as I'm concerned, maintaining this kind of premium on block space or trying to create a premium on block space at this point is like vindictive. It's like, fuck you. Fuck you for using Bitcoin. I'm going to make you pay through the nose for using Bitcoin. Fuck you. That's what it says to me. And I mean, it's like, are you trying to create adoption or are you trying to create an environment occupied only by elites and pre-existing entrenched interests because those are the people that are going to be able to afford to live best in this ecology that you're trying to create that person in Zambia or or that that guy in, in Zimbabwe or wherever the fuck he is New Zealand he's not going to be able to use Bitcoin <clears throat> the way it was intended to be used because a certain number of us have said you can't do that and I, I, I think that's that's just offensive you know miners I really think you guys got to take it by the take the bull by the balls here and and just dev up the version of Bitcoin that doesn't have the SegWit in it, has bigger blocks, and, and and put it out there. You know, use some of your your Twitter sock puppets if you have any, or just friends, and get them to promote it. You know, the the OGs. The people that know exactly how Bitcoin was was intended and did operate up through, I would say, 2013, 2014. Then we started having the, the block size issue. Um, <laughs> I think if, if we were to continue on the trajectory we were headed on in, in 2013, 2014, we wouldn't be experiencing this right now. As a matter of fact, Bitcoin Cash wouldn't even exist. If it did, it, it would exist for a different reason. But it wouldn't be because somebody waved a magic wand and said, we're masters of Bitcoin and you're not going to have one, more than one megabyte of block space. <laughs> Come on now. Satoshi gave this shit to everybody. He didn't just give it to a bunch of fucking nerds. He didn't give it to, to a president or a king or anybody. He gave it to everybody. So let's get busy on that, you know? Anywho, <clears throat> I got this uh, this article here, and, and this would be a perfectly reasonable explanation for a, a significant dip in the price of Bitcoin. Um, whether it is the cause, I would say probably not. I think, I, like I said before, my, my thesis on it is this. When I start seeing complaints about the fucking mempool backing up and a bunch of unconfirmed tri- transactions is uh, when I when I saw that it was I guess it was 27,000 transactions hey, that's 10 blocks I don't know that's more than 10 blocks it's 13 blocks 13 and a half 
let's get serious. So, you know, if you if you equate that out, that's, well, let's see, 13 and a half. That's about two and a half hours that you're going to be waiting for your transactions just to catch up with what they were at that point. Assuming, of course, no additional transactions piled up since then. And I believe that's an unreasonable unreal- explanation expectation there might be some sort of dip in the in the actual usage of bitcoin when when people see their fees go up to a certain point they say oh fuck that i'm gonna use verge it's gonna cost me two cents and i'm gonna get a 10 million dollars transacted for me to some guy in zimbabwe or tokyo or or whoever else wherever else i'm not gonna put up with this bullshit of $15 $15 transaction fee. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We've already been through that. See, to me, that would explain a significant dip in the price of Bitcoin. Is people just, fuck this. I'm not going to pay that fucking transaction fee. Next time, I'm going to transact in a different coin. I'm going to fucking use Litecoin. Fuck those guys. I'm gonna use I'm gonna use fucking Ethereum or something else, but I'm not going to to be extorted to do a transaction. I mean, really, when when Bitcoin cannot compete with a Visa transaction, you are fucking up. Cause not all that long ago, Bitcoin was kicking Visa's ass. So, what's changing here, kids? Come on now. Got to get on the stick and get off of this idea that you're going to be Visa or be the the settlement layer for Visa because that's not really what we're doing here in Bitcoin. And eventually, I believe, the alterations in the incentive structures proposed with Lightning, the eventual effects will be that Bitcoin will be no better than Visa. You'll have your two-way reversible transactions because your transactions aren't really happening on the blockchain. And that's going to take a significant incentive away from the miners. When they're looking at the blockchain and they're saying, okay, well, there's 2,000 transactions in that block and the total value of them was about, oh, I don't know, $20,000. And then they look over at Bitcoin Cash and they look and they see that they're not necessarily getting full blocks, but they're getting three quarters of a block filled at 64,000 transactions per block. So, oh, well, wait a minute now. There, there's there's 48,000 transactions in there, and they're they're about 15 th- 15 cents a piece. I, I think I'd make a lot more money if I if I mined Bitcoin Cash. And there you go. You're going to see a flippening then where all of the hashing power that was supporting Bitcoin just gets sucked right out from under it and it gets attacked and forked and all of those fucking lightning network things are are all fucked. Because the record that they're they're touching back to has now been corrupted irrevocably and they're either going to have to start over or they'll just continue to lie to everybody. Oh yeah, everything's fine. You know, but you start missing your payments or something because there's an asymmetry somewhere in the background, and you're continually getting fucked by the bank that's you, that you're using to do your transactions with. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna continue to take payment in Bitcoin and and deal with that bullshit just because it's got the name Bitcoin on it? Probably not. I know I wouldn't. We're no longer in a sphere where there is a monopoly potential, kids. I mean, there can be some limitations that governments do apply to regulated exchanges and whatnot, but there is nothing saying that people cannot create their own markets in which they they use cryptocurrencies that aren't necessarily listed on any open exchanges. Or any public exchanges, or or at least any clear net exchanges. Maybe they're all dark web. Who is to say? All I do know is that the reins are off. 
and, and we are going to see this whole thing play out until we get it through our fucking heads that this is a global network or these are global networks rather because we're not just limited to Bitcoin anymore and that the, the point now is going to be competition can you provide a better service than everybody else if you cannot you will not have adoption people will adopt coins that are more convenient and easier for them to participate in this is the rule of the game and it's it's not something that I it, I'm just recognizing it I'm just restating it back to you this is the nature of the game now it's not what you want and I, I said this to somebody else it was, it was um, I think I posted it on Twitter that you know because because Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are open source you can rest assured that everything that can happen will happen whether or not you want it to <laughs> that's <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever said anything truer <laughs> honestly <laughs> I, I do not believe that I, I've ever said anything true about cryptocurrencies is that you know if you if you create a limitation that is too noxious or too too much of a pain in the ass to deal with people won't do it you know this idea and I, I said this to Twatter today on uh, Twitter that uh, you know the idea uh, who who thinks that millions and millions of people out there are going to be firing up lightning nodes to be assisting one another in transactions. And I mean, and now think about this, okay? It would only take just a teeny tiny more power to run a miner than it would to run a lightning network node. Now, just for a moment, just think about this. If all of you people out there that are running lightning nodes and and people who want to run lightning nodes and want to participate, if all of you just ran one miner, if every single one of you just one miner, this bullshit with we're competing with Jihan Wu or whatever, eh, no, go away. It, it goes away. And you will learn through the process of mining the kind of power that you have as a miner. Which version of Bitcoin that you want to mine. And through the consensus of your participation, we will define for the world what Bitcoin is. You like SegWit? Mine ver the variant of Bitcoin that has SegWit. But what you're going to find out by doing that is whether or not it is the most profitable for you as a miner to do it. And remember, you're supposed to be doing this out of your own self-interest, not in the interest of somebody's political bullshit, out of your own self-interest. You're supposed to be watching out for your own bunghole in this. So if you're running a variant of Bitcoin, and, and you're talking to your friend and you're and he's like, dude, I'm running this version of Bitcoin on my miner and it, I'm getting like three, four, four more terra hashes on, on my rigs. So you, you might want to like upgrade to this one because it's actually running more efficient. And I know you're running the same hardware that I am. And so I, I think it would probably work out for you. You could try it out on your hardware and find out. Now, I know there's there's some spin up and slow down time because you don't just like slam them slam them off or whatever but anyway the the point being that that power is yours and we've been a lot of people have been shirking it off myself included onto miners and they've been having to make these decisions for for the rest of us and i th i think that tendency it's it's just the way that we've been kind of conditioned to be relying on government for things that they really shouldn't be doing and and relying on companies to do things that they really shouldn't be doing that we could be doing just just the same you know like growing food and stuff like that and through taking responsibility for those things you can reflect back to the market your your demand and i think that's 
that's one of the things that separates Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies from a lot of other markets that we've had before is that you have a pallet out in front of you. You could be mining one of 1,500 different coins out there, not counting ICOs, if those even have a mining. I, I don't. Some of them, I think, do or, or plan to eventually, but there's still like ERC-20 tokens at the time. You could be mining Ethereum. You could be mining any one of these. And you've got this whole pallet out in front of you of what way you could be mining them. And so really it comes down to which one becomes more profitable for you. You know, maybe Verge is more profitable for you to mine. Maybe Litecoin. You know, maybe maybe Ethereum. Who knows? The only person that does is you. You know, if you see potential in a project, and maybe it's not profitable now, but maybe you think it's going to be profitable in the ne in the near term. You know, that strategy is for you to work out, and through you doing that and exercising your will that way. That's what's motivating the market. The problem is, there are just too few of you out there that are taking up that sword. You know, you got that, that vorpal blade of digital finance in your hand, and you know, too many of you are chopping onions with it. <laughs> you gotta, gotta turn that thing into a sledgehammer. Execute some will out there, people. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw it back down into some music. And uh, I got some nothing face here for you. Can't wait for violence here on Coin Metal. Sorry about that. I let it go just a teeny tiny over. I was in the middle of tweeting to Ryan Reynolds. He's got a got kind of a secret man crush on the guy just because he plays Deadpool so fucking well. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I I had to tweet to the man because well you know. That's what Twitter's for, right? Anyway, we never got into this fucking article. I just realized that as soon as I went to music break, I'm like, you know what? I sat here and I talked shit about this this article. I talked all the way around it. Never even got into it. Anyway, here it is. The cryptocurrency market loses $50 billion as South Korean exchange is suspected of fraud. This is by Ricardo Estevez. Written May 11th, 2018 at 5 p.m. Of course, no indication of what time zone. Come on, Ricardo, we're international. <clears throat> anyway, uh, this is on newsbtc.com. If you did not catch that the first time, if I did not deliver it the first time. Continuing on. The cryptocurrency market turned upside down on Friday, having lost about $50 billion dollars market capitalization overnight. With the exception of only Augur, Knowles, and Tether, the whole list of top 100 digital currencies are on the red. The dreadful sentiment seems to be a reaction to reports that South Korea's exchange upbit is suspected of fraud. Great, we're, re we're reacting to suspicions. Well, I don't know. I've seen I've seen us do that. Anyway, continuing on. Cryptocurrency market plunges as South Korea's upbit exchange suspected of fraud. The price of Bitcoin dropped below the $9,000 mark and Ethereum failed at the $700 handle within a period of 24 hours as South Korea's cryptocurrency ecosystem awaits further news regarding the suspected fraud executed by one of the largest operators in the country, Upbit. What is now known is that the local mainstream media outlets have reported that a joint action between the Korean Financial Intelligence Unit, KIU, and the Financial Services Commission and Seoul Police has resulted in the raid of Upbit's offices. The authorities suspect the management team has falsely reported its deposited funds. Hmm. Ren, Ren Nguyen, 
the host of the Crypto Trader Show on CNBC Africa, has confirmed that the cryptocurrency market is being drained as concerns concerned users take their funds out of the upbit exchange. As digital currency investors are very likely withdrawing their assets only to deposit them with other, with another operator, the 50 billion lost in the, in a period of a few hours might return very swiftly. Hmm. The cryptocurrency exchange has notified its clients on the matter and explained that its platform and services are continuing operation. Customers are still able to make transactions and withdrawals, according to the company who ensures that client assets are safe. Upbit is currently under investigation by prosecutors and is cooperating. The South Korean operator dealt approximately $1.6 billion of digital currency trades in the last 24 hours, which makes it the largest cryptocurrency uh, the largest cryptocurrency in the country and the fourth in the world by daily trading volumes. Hmm. Following a number of regulatory discussions to curb excessive speculation and money laundering, Korean authorities have banned initial coin offerings, ICOs, as well as foreigners and financial institutions from using local exchanges. The financial watchdog also raided a number of venues to enforce the legislation put in place, especially after the infamous coin check hack. Upbit, a digital currency exchange launched in September of 2017 by fintech startup Dunamu and headed by CEO Lee Sergu, has been active in preventing damage due to illegal fraud by offering rewards to customers who would identify multi-level scams funding through ICOs. Original complaint complainants were offered as much as 1 million won, approximately 900 US dollars. Oh, there you go. That's that's how you regulate shit, bitch. You know, you don't need the uh, the South Korean uh, financial entities or financial regulatory entities involved you just say hey if you find some motherfuckers that are trying to scam motherfuckers give us a tip we'll give you some money i I don't see any problem here but anyway a lot we're seeing a lot of investigation a lot of accusation but not a lot of material goods here so I, I don't know. I, I I know that South Korea is big into trading cryptocurrencies, but as to as to whether or not Upbit is is guilty of fraud of any kind, I really can't comment on that because I don't trade on their exchange. But the question really is, in my mind anyway, what exactly is the nature of the fraud? And again, they're only under suspicion of it. So this could just as well be a fishing expedition on the part of the of the uh, federal regulators in South Korea, where they're trying to get a wrangle on exactly who is using these exchanges and how much money they are running through them. And I I guarantee you, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to predict the future, and I'm going to predict it with certainty of the utmost kind and you will find out you will hear it you will see it this is what's going to happen and, and and you know what you might not even see it you might not hear about it at all it just might stop at that article but what's going to happen is they are going to investigate a bit and what they are going to find in their audits if they actually do any is that they're going to find a financial regulator or his son or his next door neighbor who happens to be a political contributor or somebody who is heavily involved in trading cryptocurrencies. And they're going to shut the fuck up about it. They're going to find out that half their fucking police force has been ganking mining gear illegally from people. And setting the shit up in their houses and mining from their homes. (laughs) 
So, you know, I, again, we're uh, we're going to find out that a lot of people are involved in this. That it, it's almost you know what it reminds me of, and and, and it happens so often that it's like I don't know, but it, it reminds me of when somebody will come out in the news and be like rabidly against homosexuality or or something to that effect you know like um oh who was that guy uh leland Yi. he was a state senator for california right hates guns passing all kinds of legislation against guns right turns out he's this huge arms trafficker and he he buys and sells military grade hardware to gangsters and yet this is the guy that's you know writing up legislation and justifications for or trying uh, passing it any or trying to pass it anyway uh, legislation to break into your home and steal your legally acquired firearms because suddenly they're out of compliance <laughs> It, we we have the same exact thing happening in cryptocurrencies, where some big regulator or something will will start barking a bunch of shit, and somebody in their office, somebody above them in the in the food chain, gets found out, and then it's all of a sudden, oh well, you know, if we really get serious about this, I'm going to end up busting my boss and he's probably not going to like me very much because he's making millions of dollars doing this thing and yeah, that's probably not really a good idea because <sighs> I, I, I want to stay alive, you know. I don't want him to, you know, find a reason to just suicide me or something like that. But th- this is the way it's it's going to happen. I... <laughs> This is the way it happened last time in South Korea. They they made all this big kerfuffle about ICOs or some shit like that. And then they just shut the fuck up about it. And I, I know for a fact, there, there were accusations even of one of their finance ministers or, or one of their kids was heavily involved in mining or, or trading or both or some shit like that. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, yeah, well, you know, maybe we can just kind of let up on this. You know, they had people so pissed at them, they were showing up at the Capitol and protesting. I I read some article about that. Somebody had tweeted that if crypto dies in South Korea, that they die. Can can you believe that shit? That's some pretty strong feeling there, you know? (sighs) Anyway, so with regard to Upbit, uh, I don't know. We got this this tweet here that we didn't read here. It's Korea. This the selling is coming from people taking their funds out of Upbit as they are concerned. These people are crypto investors and won't leave crypto. They will go to other exchanges and buy there. Expect a huge bounce. Mm, I don't know about that business. Like I said, I I think that the um, the reaction that we're seeing on Bitcoin right now, I think it has more to do with the fact that the uh, the mempool is, is getting backlogged. You know, that, that fee market is going up and people are less inclined to transact Bitcoin. And that has a cascade effect on everything else. You know, because people try and extract as much value out of their bitcoin as they can so they'll they'll retail sell and that causes a a cascading effect on the price so you know i i i would not attribute it solely on this this upbit business it can play a contributor i'm not going to deny it what it would i mean because anything like this it in the media, it acts like a big old slap in the face for us. You know, people start looking at us out of the corner of their eyes and saying, hmm, is this, thing, is this thing really going to sustain or, you know. But we've made it through everything else like this. So I, I think eventually Bitcoin, the uh, the miners will see that 
see what's going on with Bitcoin Cash and say, hey, look, I want to keep mining on the Bitcoin blockchain, but this is the the segregated witness thing is just bullshit. It's not it's not paying off like you you said it would, and it's costing us both now and in the future because people are planning projects on other coins. And this is a real danger, especially with Ethereum out there. As a matter of fact, I got this article here on CCN.com. Flippening between Bitcoin and Ethereum will happen in 2018. Roger Veer said this, supposedly. Bitcoin Cash promoter Roger Veer believes Bitcoin Cash will one day overtake Bitcoin to become the world's most valuable cryptocurrency. But before that happens, he believes Ethereum will take Bitcoin's crypto crown. Veer, once known as Bitcoin Jesus, told The Independent that so-called technologically superior cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin Cash will surpass Bitcoin in value in the coming months and years. Veer sees Ethereum surpassing Bitcoin by year's end and Bitcoin Cash by 2020. And now analysts refer to this supposed development as, quote, the flippening. Veer printed, I, I'm sorry, Veer pointed to slow transaction times and high fees undermining Bitcoin. He noted that more than 1,500 cryptocurrencies have entered the market since Bitcoin's 2009 inception and attempts to overcome Bitcoin's limitations. In attempts, that is. Bitcoin's rise in value in the last year has carried other cryptocurrencies, with Ethereum and Bitcoin Cash outpracing Bitcoin. Bitcoin's price has jumped 450% from $1,700 to 9360 in the past 12 months, while Ethereum has gained 1,000% or has gained 1,000% to 764 and Bitcoin Cash moved from 500 in August to 1,500 and, or 1,655. Actually went higher than that. I know because I sold when it was at 18. Ethereum has five times as many units in circulation as Bitcoin, making its market cap slightly less than half of Bitcoin's. Veer stated in January that that Bitcoin Cash will continue its steady growth and surpass Bitcoin in the near future. Quote, Bitcoin Cash is the same version of Bitcoin that everyone fell in love with and used from 2009 until 2017, he said. It has the same economic code that led it to becoming a worldwide phenomenon. I'm sure that formula will continue to work for Bitcoin Cash into the future, and it will surpass Bitcoin in usage, popularity, and market cap in the near future. Hmm. Uncertainties remain. Not all cryptocurrency experts agree with Veer. Michael Jackson... Skype's former COO, now working at Mangrove Capital Partners, said Bitcoin can overcome its shortcomings and thereby offset other cryptocurrencies' benefits. I, I could agree with that. Jackson said solutions are being sought for Bitcoin's scalability issues. There aren't any needed, fucker. We already have it. The fuckers are ignoring it for some bullshit. He further noted that Bitcoin is by far the best known cryptocurrency and the reserve cryptocurrency. <laughs> Dude, it loses that status as long as it's too ex as soon as it's too expensive to transact. Veer acknowledged that Bitcoin could remain the top cryptocurrency, but he doesn't think it is likely. He said Bitcoin Cash's utility could drive its price to hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't disagree with that assessment at all. Veer acknowledged that Bitcoin could... Oh, let's see here. While it's not guaranteed, Bitcoin Cash has more than doubled in the past month, and the interest of big investors could, come, could cause its value to double by next week, Veer said. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. 
In the short term, though, the entire market has suffered a setback, with both Ethereum and Bitcoin Cash taking bigger hits than Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency market has declined more than $50 billion over the past 24 hours as the Bitcoin price declined by more than 8% and other major cryptocurrencies along with tokens experienced an intensified movement on the downside. Where Bitcoin fell 8.68%, Ethereum lost 11.96% and Bitcoin Cash dropped 1707 according to CCN's Cryptocurrency Market Cap Index. Hmm. Alright, and so that is the finish of that one. Yeah, Bitcoin Cash and, and Ethereum overtaking Bitcoin. Oh god damn you fuckers. hate fucking pop-ups fucking web page anyway um <clears throat> yeah as far as ethereum and bitcoin cash taking over uh, taking over in this space i see that as a real possibility because again it the the market stopped being all about bitcoin back in like 2013 2014 with the advent of altcoins and since then any drives to push push this first mover advantage too hard all it does is the same pressure that is same thing that every pressure does the exact opposite happens so with Bitcoin we're seeing a depreciation in the number of users and the number of transactions happening on the network it was increasing because it was getting better to transact in Bitcoin again. But now the fees are starting to catch up and it's blocking out transactions. So, in the longer term, I think we are going to see that a lot of the miners are, are understanding the kind of change that Lightning and, and Segwit will really bring to them. And, oh, here it is. And, and I, I'm looking it up on Segwit charts, and here it is. I, I knew this would happen. And this is one of the reasons why I said to a few other people that I really felt Veer might be a Segwit proponent. And let me explain that one. If you were trying to get Bitcoin if you were trying to get it to convert all the way over to SegWit, you would want you need to get all of the transactions in the blocks to be SegWit transactions. And and it has been on the climb due to things like Coinbase adopting it and so on and so forth. But one of the effects that I, I felt was going to happen because of the creation of Bitcoin Cash was that the efforts to make the blocks bigger on the Bitcoin blockchain would go away. And that would what would happen is the traffic would go to other networks. You know, we'd go to Bitcoin Cash, we'd go to Ethereum, we'd go to Ripple, we'd go to Litecoin, we'd go to Verge. And because of that, there's a there's a continuous number of transactions that have been happening. And if you look, I knew it. I knew it. If you look on on um, on SegWit charts, you can see that the number of transactions as a whole have dropped off in the in the last uh, the last few blocks on this chart, and it's been on a downtrend. But the percentage of of SegWit transactions has remained relatively the same the entire time, and there is actually one or two blocks here where these number of SegWits SegWit transactions actually exceeded or actually were the entire block it looked like and so you know there you have it less and less people are using Bitcoin legitimate people and the number of transactions that have been SegWit transactions have been staying continuous this entire time but as the traffic drops off from regular Bitcoin transactions, 
this this persistent number of SegWit transactions appears to be a greater percentage of the block. So we will see. We will see. I think that over the longer term, we may in fact see see SegWit take over Bitcoin, and and then the the fuckinging will happen. <laughs> where, where the vast majority of all the transactions that are happening are happening off chain, and probably between big players, and and not you anymore. You'll you'll be on Bitcoin Cash or something else that you can actually afford to transact in, because that's that's just the way people are, and and that's the way this market is supposed to work. But I I think that. As the incentive structure changes on Bitcoin's network, people are going to find out that it is less favorable to them. And this first mover advantage will be pushed even further and pushed even further and pushed even further until they have absolutely no choice but to pay $5 a transaction on their their fucking lightning node that they don't even run a lightning node. They run like a, a dummy wallet on their fucking cell phone. And they're having to pump their transactions through a third party arbiter. Completely antithetical to the way that Bitcoin is supposed to work. Now whether it actually fleshes out to that, I, I, I don't know. I can't tell you. But I do know this. That the differential in cost for transacting is going to dissuade people from using it. And you're going to have the hardcore users that want to do the lightning node thing and then they're going to find out as the bigger players take more and more of the block space that they're going to have to have certain regulatory licenses or something to that effect where they're having to comply a little bit further than they've had to, you know. Like they'll have to pay for a software license or they'll be restricted to using certain hardware because, you know, we can't, we, we've got to keep the Bitcoin blockchain secure and, and so on and so forth. Or the worst thing that could happen is they do get the SegWit thing, right? They do get the, the uh, Lightning Network thing and then they get adversarial nodes. And th- this is, Something that they're not, they haven't been talking about all that much. And I think this is what's going to end up driving it to where you need to be a licensed operator. Because if you're not licensed, you could be a bad actor. And if you're, you're a bad actor, we gotta be able to hold you to account. So you've gotta pass AML, KYC bullshit just to register. Or again, you'll have to pay for some software that you have to license with the with the issuer of the software. Maybe paying subscription fees per transaction or some shit like that. But I think that all of the, the cost burden and technical burden that they're in, they're trying to impose on Bitcoin. Again, it's going to dissuade the vast majority of people that are already involved in cryptocurrencies. They're going to take their traffic to other other networks. And then it'll be re 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 shuffling the fucking the the deck chairs on the Titanic as the trust just goes out of the functionality of Bitcoin. Now, I <laughs> I, I think that that's that's just the way this market goes. I mean, it's just it's a pressure thing, you know, and it's a big game, you know. And it, as as one side gets more pressure, it pushes to the other side, you know. There's not, and and we've got this this article here, and this is one of those things that will push the traffic to other networks. And here it is, Ripple. XRP Pilot cuts payment fees up to 70%. Hmm. Distributed ledger startup Ripple published the results of its X Rapid Pilot program on Thursday. And this is 
This is authored by um, Nicholas D. And I, I think we've confirmed yes, penis on that. I'm not. I'm, I'm not entirely certain. Uh, this was authored May tenth, two thousand eighteen, at two or uh, twenty twenty hundred hours UTC. Distributed ledger startup Ripple published the results of its X Rapid pilot programs on Thursday. The report focused on the company's offering centered around the cryptocurrency XRP, stating that pilot takers saw significant savings on fees as well as overall transaction times. The company has announced a number of partnerships in recent months with companies piloting XRapid as well as XCurrent, another offering that does not utilize XRP. Hmm. Head of product head of product Ashish Burla told Coindesk that the company looked at seven pilot projects, finding that the results were fairly similar across the board. As a result, the startup aggregated the data into the 40-70 percentage savings released in its report on Thursday. He also noted that transactions across borders took only a few minutes, compared to a period of several days for traditional payments of that kind. Platforms pivoting, piloting X Rapid recognized that speed, he said, adding they were like, wow, this entire thing happened in a matter of seconds all the way through. And that's just not possible given the way current legacy financial system works. While the transactions from one financial institution to another took a few minutes, the portion actually involving the XRP ledger only took a few seconds, Berla said. The bulk of the time spent was caused by the institutions converting fiat to XRP and back through local exchanges. Quote, it takes a few minutes to process and send out into local rails, he said. Now Ripple plans to focus on moving from pilot programs to full-scale launches, he said. There are, though there, there is no firm timeline yet for those plans. Quote, we're working to continue running pilots, and we're working on putting the fina- final touches on the product. The next step is, is now is moving those customers from pilot to production, Burla explained, adding, quote, With financial products and payments, there is no Silicon Valley move fast and break things. We really have to make sure we're buttoned up from a security stampo- standpoint from the compliance standpoint. Dude, worry much less about compliance, worry much more about security. Yeah. Anywho, let's see. They continue running, must be a sting. Must sting, yeah, get on board, here we go, currently. I'm just reading through some of the comments on here, and I'm not seeing, let's see here, Make it scalable since miners cannot support it. This makes it impossible to bootstrap. Well, yeah. Anyway, I was just reviewing some of the comments on here, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm I'm tempted, really. Um, fuck it, we will. I uh, got this one by Premium Mine, or Mind rather. As the coin, oh, sorry, the code is open source, but the network is not. As the coin XRP is pre-mined, it means one must have large server farms to truly make it scalable, since miners cannot support it. This makes it nearly impossible to bootstrap an XRP deployment on one's own. Only one person has managed to do it, and that is the co-founder of Ripple who then started his own platform called Stellar. (laughs) Um, Premium Mind, um, XRP is not legal tender. The author of this article neglects to mention this fact. The single fact is, what has hampered XRP's adoption worldwide, from MoneyGram, Western Union, to adoption by banks. Hmm. Bye Bye Pig, Will they be using XRP in the future or not? 
I want to know that because as far as I know, XRP is a scam. I do have 45% of my portfolio on XRP now, but I am very, very worried and ready to jump onto another coin as soon as I find something good. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. And then uh, we got a couple couple other responses to that. Uh, Yuguzu, wait until May 15th. Big announcement coming from Ripple. Okay. Another response. Uh, Gerben D. Z um, Zoo, are you an investor or just a gambler? If you call XRP a scam, you obviously didn't do your homework. If you did, you would know you were sitting on a gold mine. Use case, clear strategy, actual adoption. Let's go and on and on. By the way, XRP is open source as said before. And let's see the response by William, Yan William J. Yancey. Uh, none of your reasons to hold XRP, they can go all the way down, are true. No one is adopting it and none of the banks are signing up with Ripple will ever use XRP or contribute to a bull run in the website we trade. And it can tank that banks don't care. Sorry for, for being brutally honest with you all. Yeah. I don't know. I've I've said before that I thought um, Ripple was scamalicious, but, you know, it's mostly due to the fact that it's pre-mined and there there isn't really like a necessary connection between XRP and Ripple. You know, the, like Ripple is a company and then XRP is the pre-mined token that they're kind of like attached to. So, I don't know. You know, I, I, I won't... I won't say it's 100% a scam, but it feels scam malicious to me. You know, especially because of the involvement of institutionals in it. And plus, I, I did read some sort of, like, technical explanation of what Ripple was supposed to do and whatnot. And, I mean, I, I named a future financial crisis by, uh, according to what I read there. I called it the GR, GR Bufu, the Great Ripple Buttfuck. <laughs> and I, I, I'm not sure that I wasn't 100% on that, but, you know, we'll, we'll find out. It all depends on the level of institutional interest in it because that's that's where it really counts you know anyway let's go ahead and throw back down into some music i got this song playing and uh i i dig it so I, i'm gonna go ahead and play this this is 99 problems by body count here on coin metal And that was Tool with Vicarious. <clears throat> and while I was uh, bopping around on my tabs here, I discarded one uh, one tab, but I picked up another one. And and uh, this one's on Sludge Feed by uh, Craig Russo, um, authored May 8th, 2018, so a little bit old for us, but... We're going to go with it anyway because I don't feel like I cover enough of the different projects kind of popping up. And this one I just wanted to give a little flavor for. Um, this is Loom Network Ads Second SDK Project Neon District, a blockchain based RPG. Hmm. This just seemed kind of interesting to me, so I'm, I'm going to go for it. <clears throat> Loom Network, a blockchain ecosystem for gamers and social apps, has announced the addition of the second project built with the Platform Software Development Kit, SDK. Neon District, a hybrid card-based futuristic MMORPG. In the announcement, Loom Network shared a few major reasons why Neon District chose to build on the Loom blockchain cheap and fast. Neon District uses non-fungible to tokens, NFTs, at its core, and Loom Dapp chains uh, support NFT transactions at lightning speeds without charging per transaction. Unparalleled Security 
Loom's Plasma Cache implementation secures the game assets on Ethereum's mainnet. Plasma Cache also secures any game asset trades as if it's on the Ethereum mainnet, but with less fees per transaction. Proof of Play DAP chains are fully featured blockchains at their core that uses delegated proof of stake DPoS, so all wins slash losses, quests, raids are stored on the on the DAP chain without co costing ether, i.e., cash money. <clears throat> Neon District is described in the announcement as a third-person cyberpunk RPG where a party of characters, equipment, and other assets that live on the blockchain progress through various stages of exciting gameplay. Players, may take, on, players take on the role of rebels called degens that are fighting the, the mainspring an autocratic and mechanical government is attempting to wipe out all previous signs of culture and independent thought. Gosh, that sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Notably, assets in Neon District, which leverage ERC-721 non-fungible tokens, become more valuable as player adv players advance in the game. Essentially, as an asset gains experience points and special abilities over time, and they become rarer, the real-world value increases since they can be traded in a P2P marketplace. This provides one of the first gaming e ecosystems that provide truly unique and individualized in-game features, as all assets record their history on the, on the Loom DAP chain. Loom Network is actively working to become the leader in blockchain gaming, often stating that games built on the blockchain are poised to take over the world. The first game built using the Loom Network SDK is Pixie Shopping Street, a user-generated content platform partnered with Pixie Wardrobe, a game with over 3 million registered users in China and Korea. <clears throat> While it is definitely still early, there are already major indications that these types of games where game, art, uh, uh, where game assets are bridged with real world assets are in fact the future of the industry. I agree. More on Loom Network. Loom Network is a platform as a service built on top of the Ethereum blockchain enabling developers to create and run large-scale decentralized applications. Loom Network leverages a system of sidechains that allows each dApp to run on its own blockchain, working to reduce the network load facing these applications to further promote speed and scalability. What's more, developers can use Loom Network's software development kit to code dApps in common programming languages. Through its platform, Loom Network aims to build a scalable infrastructure for the creation of blockchain-based games and social applications. Oh, I guess there's more to it. <clears throat> Loom Network, a blockchain ecosystem for games. Oh, this is authored on April 16th. Uh, I don't know how far that we want to go into this. Yeah, let's go for it. <clears throat> Let me get a quick drink of water here, because getting a little parched, as you may have noticed. <sighs> Jiu-jitsu is some sweaty work, let me tell you. Continuing on, Loom Network, a blockchain ecosystem for games and social apps. Decentralized applications, dApps, hold a great deal of promise as they don't require a middleman to function or to manage a user's information. The places users, this places users in control of their own personal data, effectively eliminating the data mismanagement and hacking events associated with more traditional centralized applications. 
However, the scale of dApps is currently limited by the blockchain networks they are built on, resulting in costly and relatively inefficient platforms. There are a number of blockchain projects actively working on building solutions to this scaling problem. One such project is Loom Network, which is a platform as a service built on top of the Ethereum blockchain, enabling developers to create and run large-scale decentralized applications. Loom Network leverages a system of sidechains that allows each dApp to run on its own blockchain, working to reduce the network load facing, facing these applications to further promote speed and scalability. What's more, developers can use Loom Network's software development kit to code dApps in common programming languages. Through its platform, Loom Network aims to build a scalable infrastructure for the creation of blockchain-based games and social applications. Interested in Loom Network? Here's a quick rundown of the project. <clears throat> in short, Loom Network is developing a platform for developers to efficiently create and deploy scalable dApps on Ethereum sidechains called dApp chains. These full-featured blockchains are designed to run in parallel to Ethereum smart contracts and are optimized for scaling data rather than financial transactions. Loom provides significant flexibility for developers creating Loom dApps through their SDK. This SDK allows them to choose their own consensus mechanism, build their own rule, rule set, and release fully contract node soft fully contract I'm sorry, fully contact node software that run that's runnable on any cloud platform. It's important to note that this SDK offers programming languages like JavaScript, which lowers the technical barrier. Loom also allows developers to integrate with traditional web, web APIs, which serves as a bridge between traditional web apps and Ethereum dApps. What's more, the Loom team is in very early exploratory talks with the Plasma team about the possibility of incorporating Plasma into Loom dApp chains, which will provide further scalability to the Loom platform. Loom has defined two major areas of focus as described on the Loom website, which we may in fact follow up if we have enough time. <clears throat> One, games that truly cannot be built without the blockchain provably scarce items, tradable tokens, eternal worlds, and multi-game spanning universes. Loom aims to facilitate the creation of blockchain-based games on the scale of World of Warcraft and Starcraft, which would be near impossible with current network limitations. Social applications being number two, that are not driven by advertising, but instead monetizable via karma tokens, which are exchangeable for ERC-20 tokens. These dApps are expandable via multi-client apps, minimization of trust, and more. The Loom team has cited the issues facing dApps like EtherTweet, which costs upwards of to a few dollars per tweet depending on network conditions as examples of current platforms that they hope to create more efficiently or recreate more efficiently. The Loom token Loom is a membership token to Loom Network. Currently there's only one membership tier, the user tier, which requires a balance of one token. The user membership tier unlocks the ability to transfer, transfer tokens and data between Loom dApp chains and the, to the Ethereum mainnet. This sounds a lot like Lightning, doesn't it? <clears throat> According to an April 2018 update by the Loom team where they announced the launch of their beta testing, 
The project stated that it currently has five internal projects at Loom and have allowed four external parties to join the beta. Number one, CryptoZombies.io, Interactive Solidity Core School, uh, Code School rather. Uh, number two, Adventures of Etherboy in the Blockchain World, a side-scrolling action game that stores its state on a DAP chain. Three. DelegateCall.com, first question and answer site on the blockchain. 4. Crypto Zombies Battlegrounds, Hearthstone style collectible card game with purchasable decks. Number 5. Crypto Zombies ran Rancho? A uh, ranch, I guess? Pokemon style battle game where you can grow, clone, and mutate your zombies to give them powers to beat other players. In that same announcement, Loom outlined the upcoming milestones for the second quarter 2018. April to have a .5 release, adding more users to the Golang SDK. May .8 release of Solidity support and opening beta up to more people. And uh, June 1.0 public beta release, the SDK will be opened up for all developers to use. The Loom Network team, which is based out of Thailand, is led by James Duffy, Luke Zhang, and Matthew Campbell. The team boasts a heavy focus on product delivery over superficial base. base super, wait, what? The team boasts a heavy focus on product delivery over superficial baseless claims. Hmm. No schedule apparently. The, this approach has enabled them to secure a spot in the Winter 2018 Techstars New York Startups class. Ooh. Token Financials The Loom Network, Loom, currently has a market cap of $95 million, with a circulating supply of 490,328,320 Loom, and then a total supply of 1 billion Loom. Final Take Loom Network is taking an interesting approach to building out a platform that actively works to solve these scaling issues related to the Ethereum blockchain. The project's focus on games and social apps provides a path for network adoption and the toolset they are creating for developers significantly lowers the technical barrier to entry. Loom Network could increase significantly in value as it continues to expand this platform. Hmm. Well, yeah. Like I said before, it sounds a lot like off-chaining and lightning networking, and you gotta wonder if there's some sort of hubbing and routing and watchtowering and all that other bullshit going on with third parties. You know, possibly loom themselves or <clears throat> some beneficiary thereof. You never know. They could be off handing it to a third party. You know, maybe an existing payments processor. You never know. Anyway, um, I, I think it's an interesting idea. And, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. I mean, there, there are a multitude of ways that this could work out um however i think the the interface between um off-chain stuff and on-chain stuff uh, i i don't know i i would have to like be far more knowledgeable about the the underpinnings of of loom network and the way this whole business works and I've got their website up right now. And let's see. I just wanted to check some information out on it and see if they have an actual like white paper or some shit. But anyway, I think it's an interesting idea and depending on the kind of success they see with the uh the existing games that they have on their network and uh, what kind of adoption they see with this SDK, um I think that'll you know, maybe over the next year or two, it'll it'll definitely predict what kind of 
success ratio they may have. See, I think a lot of I think there's a lot of potential for platforms such as Xbox and such as PlayStation <clears throat> to be leveraging their existing hardware networks. You know, like say for example you you had the choice with the next iteration of the Xbox where they had like three tiers, right? You know, one is the baseline model. You're not necessarily interested in mining, but you might be mining with it during your downtime, during time that you're not actually gaming with it, or maybe during the time that you're actually using it as a media device, a multimedia device, because I'm sure it can feed you Netflix and mine in the background just fine. Your browser seems to do it. But anyway, so the next iteration of Xbox, you got three tiers, and each one is geared towards a specific demographic, right? So you're not necessarily interested in mining with it, but you could be mining with it in the background in the times that you're not gaming with it, or during the times when you're playing games that aren't necessarily as resource intensive, or, you know, as long as it's not deprecating your gameplay significantly, that it, you'd be running some sort of mining in the background, right? And then, you know, the, the next tiers up are people that are more interested in mining. You know? They, they still want to be able to play games on it. They still want to be able to watch multimedia on it and do all that shit at the same time. And be mining. But, they're actually looking to make a return on their mining. So, they go the next model up. And then the next model up after that. See, that's, that's the kind of thinking I have with regard to this, this whole blockchain cryptocurrency business is that, you know, Microsoft could be mining their own coin on both Microsoft, any Microsoft platform device that you could dedicate some, some power to that you can right but now maybe maybe microsoft goes just one step further right where they say okay we're not going to do our own coin but what we are going to do is set up several mining pools for or at least open up the the ability of other people to set up mining pools that are completely open for the public to participate in and you'll be able to dedicate your hashing power from your Xbox or your PlayStation to the mining of this coin or whatever coin that you want you know maybe they they offer you a list of like five or six coins that you could be dedicating your hashing power to and you'd be able to check on the network and monitor your your metrics and see how it's playing out for you. You know, be checking whether or not it's more profitable for you to be dedicating your Xbox to Monero or Litecoin or Bitcoin itself or Bitcoin Cash. That you'd be able to check it out and evaluate for yourself which one is more profitable. Maybe organize with some friends. Pool up on your own create your own mining pool but of course you know you'd expect that Microsoft would have at least their license copy but as long as it doesn't do things like in the background like steal some of your your hashing power for their own network you know then that's cool you know but again I, I think this is a point where Microsoft could partner up with like Intel and a few others develop a robust UI for an SDK of their own but that would and make it to where it will interact very well with APIs for coins and existing exchanges and so on and so forth and and seriously that's that's the kind of level of competition that you can introduce into this market and and of course Microsoft would have first mover advantage but they wouldn't, you know, because they've already got all kinds of infrastructure deployed. You know, they, they've got your desktop, they've got your phone maybe, they've got your laptop, they've got your 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 uh, gaming console. You know, so 
there, there's a lot of room to flex in there. I could see in the future where they could really lose market share, really force people to use other operating systems if they were abusing that position. You know, like shadow mining on your fucking Xbox and not cutting you in on it. Or on your Microsoft operating system. But it's a, it's a potential stepping stone into good favor for them. You know, it's that double-edged sword. They could be flexing it to both your advantage and their advantage. You know, provide you with the shovel, the pick, or at least the molds to, to crank out your own shovel heads and pick heads and make shovels and picks for other people to use. And just provide you with a fundament, a hardware infrastructure, a software infrastructure that's available for you to interact with. And I think this is a, a place where, where Microsoft could ding a lot of players, not just in mining, not just in cryptocurrencies, <clears throat> but also in in some of the other developments that we're seeing, you know, with with people wanting to do mining in in games or so on and so forth, that that's a position that Microsoft already fills a lot of voids and could be taking advantage of. But I, I think their their monopolistic nature and their their company's credos will prevent them from really enjoying that position to its fullest anyway, to their fullest advantage. I could be wrong. You know, maybe maybe the the next CEO will will be a you know, a veteran miner or something like that and just look at that fucking Xbox and say, why isn't this thing got a, a why isn't it pumping out terahashes worth of mining power? You know, why is it just sitting there doing nothing for about sixteen hours a day? It's plugged in, it's it's attached to the network it's not doing anything. It's not doing anything for the user. It's not doing anything for us. There you have it, Microsoft. There's your next decade if you can fucking pull your heads out of your asses and really embrace this shit and the idea of being interacting with, with the community is more than just end users. And it is with that that I like to... Well, no, I got a, I got a lot of I got a lot of time left. My apologies, I was misreading my clock, but I do want to drop down into some music, get rehydrated a little bit, maybe spit out one more article at the end. I don't know, but we're gonna go for it anyway. Here it is: "The Blister Exists" by Slipknot. Here on Coin Metal. Oh, I was tempted to let that one go, but, uh, yeah, I think I can squeeze one more quick article in before we close out for the evening. And, uh, yeah, we covered that, covered that, and... <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I, I've got to do it just because, you know, I hate the concept but I, I, I always have hope that somebody's going to figure out a way that they think they can get away with it for a little while, but they're going to find out it doesn't work in the long run. Anyway, uh, this is on CCN.com. Haven launches world's first online store to solely accept a stable cryptocurrency as payment. Oh, wait, this is a paid-for submitted release. Okay, does it, CCN does not endorse nor is responsible for any material included below and isn't responsible for any damages. So just just to let you know, there's a little... We're not responsible for this shit. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. Uh, Sydney, April 30th, 2018. Haven, a decentralized mobile... Uh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Oh no, this is press release May, May 11th. I just had to check and verify on this Haven a decentralized payment network and one of the first ever stable coins 
has today set out to prove the real-life payment use for a stable cryptocurrency in an international scale with the launch of its own e-store. Dedicated to solving volatility through its dual network stablecoin, Haven is working towards making mainstream use and acceptance of cryptocurrencies for everyday payments a reality. The Haven e-store is the first online shop in the world to directly accept a stable cryptocurrency in exchange for physical goods. It will run indefinitely and provide a real use case for stablecoins for the benefit of merchants and cryptocurrency holders all over the world. The Haven eStore launch comes just nine weeks after its token sale, which raised $30 million and received the backing of well-respected industry leaders such as Block Tower and X. In its early stage, the eStore will solely accept the first iteration of Haven's nomin stablecoin called EUSD. <laughs> That's not to confuse anybody, I'm sure. EUSD, which is backed by Ether, keeps a stable value of one. <laughs> oh God, keeps a stable value of one U.S. dollar, meaning participants can transact with the assurance their currency's value will not fluctuate. <laughs> Oh god, that is fucking hilarious. <laughs> the new e-store is a notable milestone for the brand and blah blah. You know, we're not going to go any further with this. I I just have one question. How exactly are you going to maintain a consistent parity with the US dollar on value? with ether as the intermediary between you and it I'm waiting yeah I, I didn't think so you don't have any guarantee of your fucking US dollar peg I don't give a fuck what mechanism you choose you are not going to burn the coins fast enough you're not going to add them fast enough you're going to run out of parity with the US dollar at one point or another fuck Tether doesn't even maintain parity. So, the the idea that, that you are going to maintain parity, I, I find it laughable. Very, very laughable. And I really don't, like I said, I don't care what mechanism you use. You can't maintain parity on a fiat currency. You just can't do it. Can't do it. One of these days you're going to figure it out. Probably after this Haven thing goes dry from you snorting the liquidity. Anyway, it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Uh, we will be back again on Monday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I'd like you all to trade safe. Because there, there's a lot of volatility going on out there. Do your homework. So you know how best to take advantage of that. And watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. So with that, I'd like to close it out, close out this episode. And it's exactly what to put in for our last dance. Fuck it. Punch in the face by Ministry here on Coin Metal. Thank you very, very much for, for listening. I certainly appreciate the support. You can find me on Twitter. Like, like and follow on there. And uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. As you may notice, I've gotten a little quicker about getting my episodes up there for you. So, until Monday, you'll have an excellent weekend. Thanks again for listening, and you'll have a good night.